This is a 31 Pearls production, all rights reserved. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. The Book of Origins is from the collection of books known as the Colbrin or Colbrin Bible. The Colbrin Bible, Book of Origins. Read by 31 Pearls. Preamble. Translated by John Laid Ledilith. This task was undertaken and carried out by order of the Tofna Elethin. Made in solemn accord. Assembled as before times at Tanagekil. Near Sunder Stow. 160 years after the death of Ardpath, the last king. 20 years after the death of Garadon Pancris. 80 years after the death of Kelwin. 100 years after the death of Afterid. 13 years after the death of the great king who died in the year of the devil's breath. This deal do, lasting upward of a dozen years, so striking the land that people lost their distinctions. And the long conflict came to an end. Forty-four years after the Battle of Strathard, when the Christian king died in his forty-sixth year. Going down with a great slaughter before the hand of Cadwallon of the First Faith who died at the hands of a treacherous king being trapped between the trees by Dinslear. In the month of September, between the seventh and the tenth day, in the third year of the reign of Ethelbred, which is the seventh year in the reign of Egfrid, son of Oswe, king of the North Saxondom, the fourteenth year in the reign of Ardwulf, king of East Saxondom, and the second year in the reign of Ketwin, king of West Saxondom. The fourth year in the reign of Lothier, king of all the Kents. And the fifth year we suffer under the afflicting fires of the Black Bull of the North. It is 222 years since the coming of the longsword wielding warbands. And 165 years since the death of Ochther. It is 130 years since the last warband came and stayed with the land they took. When Britain ceased to be. During the reign of King I-4. These are the elect Kale Wardens who undertook the work. Humog and Lewin of the Gutra Doors. Pencluith the Dalradan, a smith of the shield makers. Heloth the Carver, born among the Scots over the sea of the shield makers. Malkin, a chief, born among quits of the engravers. Enelec the Potter, born among the quits of the shield makers. Ipdruid the Grinder, born at Alcuth of the Coppersmiths. Fronwin the Swordmaker, Son of Clud, a Briton born as a freeman among the Saxons to the west, and an engraver of note. Edwin the Elder, a talesman who writes, born of a Mercian of the shieldmakers. And Glason, the Englinger, who became one of us. Book of Origins Chapter 1 The World Birth this is an unhappy time of strife and change. And the old folk knowledge and skills are passing away like leaves falling on flowing water. We of the Gwydinad are therefore gathered together under the shield of her wheel for the purpose of preserving the things dear to our hearts. To do this, we firstly discover their biding places. And secondly, commit into writing all the hallowed tales concerned with them. Also, as the mortal memories of men perish with their frail bodies, we deem it well to commit into book writing the old knowledge once written in our minds. Behind us lie fourteen earth generations of mankind, and this has been the manner of their naming. 
The generation of light. The generation of fire. The generation of water. The generation of grass. The generation of trees. The generation of wood and the generation of stone. And all these together are the blissful generations. Then followed the generation of the spear, the generation of the axe, the generation of the shield, the generation of the sword, the generation of the bow, the generation of the helmet, and the generation of the chariot. And all these together are the homeless generations. The years before us contain six full earth generations. And whatever remains of this generation of change. Each of the past earth generations was three times the length of the one which followed it. Men ask, as men always will, how the widespread, wonderful world came into being. And whose were the feet first treading the good soil upon it? This, masters, is the old tale concerning the dawn time of life. Handed down from the blissful morning days of Earth's existence. Before time was born, it could be conceived. Before all things seeable by the darting eyes of men were seen by any eye, they were conceived. Before sound was heard by any listening ear, it was conceived. All things now knowable by man were first conceived by none but the inconceivable one existing solitary in awesome loneliness. Back in the pre-dawn state, there was no feeling, throbbing, loving life beyond the alone one. There was nothing in which something other could be perceived and manifested. The inconceivable one's reflecting mirror was not yet made. Love, the sunlight of life, could not be known. For even one so great could not yet conceive a state of satisfaction in self-love. The one thing not capable of conception was the realization of responsive love. So from the inconceivable one there came a great outpouring melody. The song of conception. The notes winging vitalizing consciousness outward in radiating ripples. All that is now existing came out of that which was harmoniously sung into being. And the sweet echoing vibrations still sound in rhythm throughout the many circles of existence. All life and matter vibrate in response to a divinely originated, orchestrated melody and rhythm. As the sweet notes of the divine, lilting music swelled outward. Heaven was formed from the song-created radiance of immortal light, rising on a higher note of ever-increasing splendor, into a great pulsating chorus. It hurled forth a whole string of worlds, scattering them in illuminating brilliance through the black matrix of Cad. It was like a handful of bright pearls being thrown into the darkness of night. In a perfectly timed cadence of melody and harmony, the worlds were hurled into separate existence, each finding its proper place in accordance with its note. All life is therefore nothing except a response to harmony and melody, to the spreading ripples and resounding echoes from the first divine hymn. The Life Awakening Song the only disharmonious notes were those which later emerged from the hearts of sinful men. The songs and poems of men, poorly stirring the unresponsive heart, are futile attempts to recapture some part of the first grand symphony. Men instinctively know they are musicians in the great orchestra of life. Singers in the chorus of existence. The song of life still vibrates upon the lute strings of each throbbing heart, filling it with responsive vitality. On earth, it can never be heard in perfection. Yet it is here, the singing lessons must be learned. For once through the dark archway, and in the court of splendor, 
The newly released spirit must introduce itself by song. The good, clean spirit vibrates with a happy, harmonious melody. While the dull, evil-doing spirit rasps out harshly in agonizing discord. The first thing the travel-weary homecoming spirit hears is the welcoming notes of the divine melody. Happy are they who harmonize with it. Sorrowful are those who vibrate discordantly. Life is a song. Sometimes a song of sadness. Sometimes a song of joy. Now a dirge, then a hymn echoes through the chambers of creation. Often a gay carol or lilting love song gladdens the ear of the air. All this is the song of life. So lift up your hearts and rejoice in the singing soul, which will, in days to come, rise on ghostly wings. To quit the inner circles of woe, where the discordant notes of mortals intermingle with the melodious notes of spirit music. Winging its way to where the Stargirt chorus sings in glory. Out from the inconceivable one came the radiating substances of Dua, who sits supreme in the invisible universal hub. And this is his circle. The outflowing notes became contrasted among themselves, dividing into two. And those that poured downwards became the substance of Mamver, the life-bringer. From the life-radiating substance of Mamver came Mamdada, who spread life wide over the world. The son of Mamdada was Dada, whose name was not spoken in the before times. And he carried the spirits of men in his seed. These are the generations of the ancestral godmen who came from Dada, as they have been known to us. And it is well to know from whence we came, we, being of their blood. We stand high among the proud races of mankind, not being numbered among the least. And sad will be the day when men lose pride in their heritage. Yet it is foretold that the day will surely come. At a time when men stand on a strange threshold. With the choice of regeneration or decay and doom. Those generated from the seed of Dada were the three heaven-sent forebears of mankind. Named Magog, Gatuma, and Kali. We are told that these were beings in spirit form dwelling apart from the universal hub at the outer reaches of Kugent. But of this, there is now no sure knowledge. It is known only that Magog ruled in the north and east, Gatuma in the south, and Kali in the west. But old tales tell of Kali's travels from the wide lands of the east to the Seagirt, Green Isle. The consort of Kali, the all knowing, he who guards the memories of men, was Kithwin, the first well beloved and they had a son and daughter. The son was dark-visaged of egg, and the daughter, Kiraway, the most beautiful of women, who set the standards of womanhood to which all who desire to catch the will-o'-the-wisp of love should aspire. The son of Gatuma was Gatamugna, the skyfighter, whose son was to wait the town founder and metal master, who married Amerith, the sky chief's daughter. Their sons were Nodinos, the first earthling, and McGilmish, the wanderer in whose days the sky chariots came. It is told how, in the glowering dawn time of the world, Amerith flew on swift wings of the spirit from her kingdom in the west to consult with Tawait, the eastern father, son of Gatamugna. They met beneath the great life tree known as Kaelstrid, which grew at Enoch. They lived a while within the green bower, set in the lush lands surrounding the life tree. And it was for her, the ring of youth was forged. This, she gave to her seducer. And so became as other women. While he lived in youth and strength, 
It is thus that the ring became known as the prize of seduction. McGilmish was a mighty one among men whose fame spread far and wide. And he was called the Lord of Battles, the Victory Winner, the Mansmiter, the Earth Burner, the Wind Fighter, and the Water Spouter, and called Gilamish before times. Those were his names among all the peoples of those days. For not all knew him by name, and some misnamed him. His son was Yovan, whose son was Beth Baal, whose son was Amalugad, whose son was Lugad, the Hammerer. The daughter of Nodinos was Epha, born of the Sky Mother. Epha married Nud, the Underearth, man, whose eyes could not bear the daylight. And their son was Gwyn, the fair faced. Epha ran away from Nud and became the wayward wife of Belisetan. The sons of Magog, the great brooder, were Khalifa and Mamagog, the fertilizer. The son of Khalifa was Helith, the life bringer, whose daughter was Amerith, the desirable, much besought by the battle kings. Those who hold to the old tongue call her Astrith, and say she was the mother of the first true man. These are not things to be hugged to the heart, for it would be a wise man indeed who knew the nature of the first mortal man after the sinful intermingling. The son of Mamagog was Beely the Bright, first husband of Dona, smiling eyes. And one of their sons was Lu Du Tears, the bright, happy cradle child who laughed in the sunshine. It is told that he shed tears of glistening dew which healed any wound. And unless these be the rainstones, the story is past understanding. He became king of Carguthrin, where tales of his times are still told in the halls. The other son, Lu's brother, was Malva's and Shriver of the Dark Tears. And it is said that if he cried, any tears falling on bare flesh would raise unhealable, weeping sores. The tale goes that Malva's possessed the bale bag, containing foul maggots of sickness and the cankerworms of barrenness and infertility. Also, it held within its folds the bale book with recipes for every dire event and tribulation. His companions were the dread-loping whale-wolves of death. But now, none knows the meaning behind the tale. We do know that Malvas was the forefather of the Dark Dwarfs. We know, too, that the ancient tale-tellers dressed wisdom and truth in garments of frivolity and motley. So only the discerning benefited, while the mindless many folk were momentarily amused. But then passed them by, as things of little consequence. Who not knowing, and looking at the mud muscle, would believe. A beauteous pearl, must lie within. The sons of Lu by his first wife. Aneth. She who caused the building of mysteryful Camillas for the glorification of men, and who died because of her desire for Thaneros, were Beely Setin and Franan. Their daughters were Branwen and that, Nertha, sometimes called Nanaku in the old tongue, who was the first wife of Nodinos, and mother of the first full woman. The sons of Lu by Morigu were Kila, Gwynon the welcomer of warriors, Lear and Robeth. And the first wife of Lear was Pandora, by whom he had two sons, Mandobrak and Franz, and a daughter, Branwen. By his second wife, the northern beauty, Lear had Thanis, Wathan and Dylan. The first wife of Beely Setin was Epha, 
Who married Nud after being cast out from her home place? His second wife was Franwi. And his son was Evilak, guardian of the gate. And his daughter was Modren, whose son was Owen, Wiseheart. The second husband of Dona was Manwadin. And their daughters were Pandora and that Aaron Rada, who gladdens the hearts of old men. They lived in the days before, the misty veil became impenetrable. And Evilak ruled the isle, containing a forest of fire apple trees. Which men now misunderstand. Many meanings are lost to those who have learned the old tales of wisdom in the new tongue. Aaron Rada married Traith, the white haired. And their sons were Athlan, the strong wave wanderer, Colhin, the teacher, and Cornena, the bull born war watcher. And their daughter was Mebid, who married Bramathamlin the son of Athlan, was Elon the sea smith of the floating forge, who married the daughter of Manwadin, for whom he made armor of a mysterious metal, which no axe, spear, sword, or arrow could penetrate. The son of Elon was Karunas, the horn-headed, who married Nulan the fair maid, daughter of Bramathamlin. She whom they of the old faith call Tanis the moon maid. But it was not her desire which brought the first daylight, it was another's. Their son was Laledkin, the larger, whose son was Hugh, great chief of the upright ones, who married Helen Bloderwed, whose son was Iad, who married Sybil, the strange priestess, whose son was Bryden whose sons were Bryden the Younger and Bellinos, the book-bearer. The son of Bellinos was Bladud, the builder, who was cured of a corrupting disease by mud from a swine's wallow. Bladud married Kelwaneth, daughter of Molmed the Wise, whose wife was Tiz Hannah, whose mother was Sybil whose husband was slain by Castwellin, the invader, while fighting with the dark men of Philistus, with whom they had sought refuge. Bethbael married Anarath, and their daughter was Anath. Athlan married Nyad, daughter of Vala. The son of Bladud was Elis, whose son was Locrinos. The son of Molmed was Marces, whose son was Camba, with whom Kelwaneth sought refuge in Fingera, over the Sea of Myrtis. The son of Camba was Humba, who failed to build his boats of ash slats. So they came apart, and he was drowned. Whose son was Erigen? Whose son was Cradolinth? The wife of Humba was Marva, daughter of Fermatamid. The son of Colhin was Nepterin, and his daughter was so withy. And Nepterin married Woklin. The sons of Mandobrak were Luke the Arbitrator, who plays with the chance chips, and Dianket, who first taught men the use of healing herbs. And that Laupton who was the uncle of Lugad and who taught men the ways of working with wood, and who could fix a spearhead immovably onto its shaft. There is a tale, at variance with others, which states that the daughter of Dianket was Newland the raven-faced, who married her uncle, which ill-omened marriage caused barrenness among cattle, and green-growing corn to lay down in shame. The sister of Nectarin was so withy of the fair isle who married Lugad, Hardhand, the hammerer, who taught the working of bronze, and was the father of our people. It is told how he was shot in the thigh 
by a dwarf's arrow. And how, every year at Samhain, the deep wound opened and erupted a vile venom which dropped off to dry into a gray powder. This wound was eventually healed by the kiss of a rainstone. And it is said that in this way, its holiness was discovered. But surely, the drops of venom are the vile rites of the dwarfs. The son of Neptune was Grackenwid, and his daughter was Nanera, who married Camelognatha, builder of the high-walled city over the water, who was the son of Ognana and Bregenda. Camelognatha sought refuge in this land and taught men the art of writing on wood and stone. The tales concerning the doings of our forebears in faith and their generations are not well known among us. For we are a different people, having another tongue. Yet, though some tell them one way, and some another, we have sought out that which is common to most. In these times of change, it is well to have an anchor in the past. But unless it bites into a sound seabed, it is of little value. It is said that the sole message which can be given to the future is words written in the past. So, we write. The Colburn Bible Book of Origins Chapter 2 The Dawn Days Generations ago, the people living in Britain were unlike those now occupying this bountiful land. And in bygone ages, great herds of cattle were tended on rolling, green plains. Southward grew long-stemmed corn. But in those long-gone days, it was not bartered with black-bearded strangers from beyond the stormy seas. The first folk holding this land were the Camledes, called Wictorin in the old tongue. But these were dwellers in the north. While southward were the dark, short-legged dwarf men known as Oban. They were kingless and chiefless, though it is said by some that stocky statured Kathleen was once their king. None knows who led the dwarf men here, though men do say the land spawned them, though the land is good. They were hag ridden, forest fearing river dwellers who painted their faces and legs, users of evilly poisoned weapons. Theirs were the grim gods of death and darkness. And at their festival times, the dwarf men sat in somber caves eating children as part of their evil feasting. They had no priests. Only dwarfesses, called Chethin. Meaning, raven adopted. And there was a great one above the others, called Harada, who lived in a smoky cave, called Hegrin. They were ruled by old hag women who prepared hellish brews in fire churns, tended by devilish, brown swaddled dwarf maidens. For they also worshipped beings dwelling in smoke. The last hag woman queen of the Oban was Kwasir, who had a cave shelter hole at Inswitten, which is the dwarf isle, now called Inisug in the western tongue. Here they worshipped the old year teller. Coming from afar on wind floats, the neighing wind horses of later days. The most hallowed of their rites were those celebrated before the May flowering, when filthy things were done, for they had no shame. Here, the children of the dusk gathered in the month of willows to worship Mamdo and her bale brood performing vile rites under the command of Blazes, their great man-god. The dwarf men, both north and south, were skin-swaddled, though sometimes wearing nettle-cloth clothes of black or brown. And like the cat, dove, and dog, they made it openly, without shame. They gathered toadstools, brockberries, ivy, wayweed, and other unwholesome plants 
using these with evil moon dew to make a maddening brew, which opened a strange door on hellish worlds. They were ruled by cowled sods and drab witches, and were unable to number beyond a score. There are dwarf men still living among us, in the forest depths, and in caverns under the earth, though none here has seen one. They quickly take to flight, and though, fearing it, will take refuge within the forest. Sometimes, a bold one will stay, and will greet the wayfarer with, Hail man, I saw you from afar but stayed. To which, the reply must be made. Before seeing you, I was as one dead. But now life comes again. Then, providing a gift is also given, the wayfarer remains unmolested. In the generations of the dwarf men, broad Britain was a many-marshed land, where dismal ferns and tangled forests hindered passage from place to place. The oban were not numerous, and their children few, but they were hardy and long-lived. Their caves were painted, even in the darkest depths where daylight never fell. For the eyes of the oban were like those of cats. They were not skillful hunters but set many traps, and in lots of ways were like children. They were playful when not engaged in dark doings. But their menfolk were not manly, nor their women womanly. They were cunning and devious, not to be trusted. Far to the south were the swarthy swarm of the Fralga, though these were not true dwarf men, but the outcome of intermingled blood. They were worshippers of Nana, the mighty mother and were ruled by many fey women who sat in night councils when the summer shiner slept. Into the land held by the short, dark oban came tall, wiry, toth, solars, who were sun folk. They came through Arana, and the country of the Nudlanders who wore galley traps. And it was in those days men began to breed swine. The first beast bred to be eaten. For only the dwarf men eat dogs and cats. The land was then called Moreddin, meaning, the place of rest. Then into the easterly lowlands came seaborne Baradon with his plowmen. And that part, lying between Hildreth and Pretangli, they made their own, and called it Holben. Baradon, was the son of Indrud, who married Hirash. Indrud was the son of Jova, who married Elsis. And Jova was the son of he who became the first father of households. Wise, hoary-headed men have treasured these tales, belonging to our first great race. The wise and noble, having its birthplace in great forest-girt mountains, Bespangled with green, sky pointing pine fingers. These are tales of times before men were men, when the big bellied murky mother ruled the world covering nether folk, sharing the land with giant endlings. The great gutted one was unaware of the wind blasted salt waters. Living in the mountain hid, thicket walled, cave places, Beyond the corn grass plains of Nanama, she knew only the cold companionship of hooded adders. There, in smoke smothered, gloom enshrouded caverns, attended by her daughter Eldie Wed, she read signs for rock stooled bailings, plucking dark wisdom from writhing flames. Lovers of the comforting fire warmth. Smoke dreamers, seekers of home heart's consolation. Not far ranging war bringers or land openers. The nether folk desired only to remain undisturbed. 
compatible companions to intangible wraiths, flitting shades, and unsubstantial ghosts. They knew full well the secrets of Gorwell. Fearing forest ruling Pafamba, they begged protection of the Nether Ogre. But among the life giving trees, he was powerless. In the smoke curtained, many pillared whole hall, Unblessed by regenerating sunray, the nether folk called upon their wan, night goddess. Their prayers weird yelpings in the ruddy gloom. Their music was the rushing gurgle and splash of falling waters. Their song, a howling whine. These were of the race, spawned long ages ago in dark mired moss swamps. Fur-needing foemen of the poison dart. Not for them, the swiftly killed sacrifice. Their delight was in painful maiming, in the broken humiliation of their betters. Woeful indeed was the yearly fate of the hag mother's spouse. On the long dark night preceding the bridal day during the Feast of Flame, they were wolf-talking, Howlers of the night, owl screeching denizens of dim caverns, speech beguilers of wild creatures in closed places, cowled and cloaked in dull clothing. They were undistinguishable in their habitat, save for the foul, nostril stinging smell of bodies, ointmented with pig fat, soot, blood, and clay. All the night, at the dark of the moon, they pranced around stone-hedged, deep-dug, glowing fire pits, their curdles upheld by the never-subsiding limb beneath. But mudded, grease-grimed and gray were the heads of the hag women seated around the ash fires, muttering darkly over the rowan omen sticks, casting spells for the hell-spewed horde. They sucked, fat dripping portions from the stone-heated pots. Only the poison-speared he-goat, leader of rituals, received choicer portions than they. Never fighters with sword. Or axe and shield. The battle-shy dwarf men were twin-handed, dart hurlers. Back-pointing. Evil-toothed, barbed short lances were their hand-carried weapons and no man's mighting metal was theirs to work. Nor did they pin their cloaks, but held them together with animal threads. They had no shields, but were agile and deft in dodging the thrusting weapons of their foes. Into the dark, wild, wooded land came blood-haired, Laudmore, son of Cal. Wave-born, encased within the ship bellies of oak and beech. Father fighter of the upright Iberus, the hearth hallower. The wife maker, the child protector. The wild herd rider. Up the flowing waters, to Muspel, place of the nether folk, came the fair skinned wanderers. Not with fight straining eyes, but with hands empty of weapons. And guileless hearts, seeking only to live out on the grass thatched plains. Their eyes fell on sights never before seen. The feast of awful. The fire smoke dancing. The open coupling before jesting, advice giving onlookers. No sight, this for maidens of the Iberus. No place for wide eyed women folk. Not for red cheeked children's curiosity, the pleasures of the dusky horde. Not for hard hunting men, the stone benches of the wolf wenches. The heavy handed ones who made men of men had come to a land demanding their care. And they were vigilant. Long into the night echoed the songs to Bill Lou and Blasies, while those of the upper born race sat sternly silent, their disgust unvoiced. No thoughts of spear reddening had they as they gazed upon the revolting antics. 
beyond the undistinguishable wall, where ruddy firelight gently kissed the face of darkness. Skulkers of the netherfolk stole the first waddled sleeper, man-child, of the lusty-lunged war-singer. Swiftly he was borne away, in the arms of the son of the day-banisher. Righteous rage broke out, in the ranks of the upright ones. No longer were the war weapons unwedded. Ready indeed, the dawn over Muspel. But in the bushes and trees about the place lurked most of the swarthy swarm. Escaped, to howl, vile threats and defiance, at the group warriors, and their protected womenfolk. Back through bramble-entangled woods, through high-grassed glades, came the weary warriors. The long, thirsty swords, still alert and eager for the blood of barbed dart throwers. That night, they camped, where they had left their guarded womenfolk. And with the dawnlight, the sentries discovered a dwarf man. It was Camward the Wrinkled. And he brought back the man-child and the heart of his abductor. Tadish, peace! cried Camward the Wrinkled before the long, sharp-pronged spear of Thunderwolf. Let be. Let us bide together. Sad tears, the dark eyes shed. Peace, said the sword sheathers. Defile not, the anket tell. Peace be. The hard-gripping hands, familiar with spear, axe, and sword, were extended in friendship, and the vengeance smiting and blood flow ceased. Then to the stockade came the small ones, emissaries for peacemaking. Megas and Shine, dwarf men of Hami, Muni, Mini, and Shindi. With Loom, the leader. Brown clad. Hooded, kirtled, belted, and entasseled. Russet skinned and ready faced. Then came wise Killen to the peacemaking. Tall, towering, sinewy, and stern. He of the generous hand. Thus was the way opened for the fair folk to enter the land. Lodmore led his people through the forested land to the white, dusty, hawthorn plains and they settled there in peace. There, they raised noble sons, white-browed, blue-eyed, slim-womaned, and dutifully wifed. Russet battle-axes were laid aside. The whetstone no longer caressed the sword. Brawny arms drove in the firmly held alder piles, raising the ash-held rafters. Spreading above them in the thick lead fern and corded grass. Laughingly, the children played. The merry maids singing, the building blows of men echoing in the clearings. In from the moors, to carry timber and stone, came sons of the night crow. Blue-skinned people, dark-cloaked. Mossy-haired men, akin to the oban. Worshippers. Of the ever-broody mother. The son of Laudmore was battle-blooded Killen, the North Rider, whose mother was Elvira, maid of the morning. And while Killen was yet young, dwarf men came to the high stockade. Emissaries, seeking allies. Killen sat with his father, listening to the words of the dwarf men. It was agreed the dwarf folk should live under the shield of Laudmore and they would labor in return. Then Killen gave them sticks for hoeing and digging, long stones for planting, leeks, beans, flax, barley, and wheat were unstintingly given, along with woven haircloth. In wooded glades, cleared by tree-encircling fires, the sowing commenced. The bow bowers were built. The swine enclosed. 
Not all the wide-ranging warriors thought as did Laudmore. For some said, Let us make masters for this dark brood of dwarf men. Let us sever the haglings from their ever-broody hag mother, the smoky hell hag of dark caverns. Let us pen them as cattle. To enslave was not the nature of the upstanding ones. Blood had been ransomed with blood, and no score remained unsettled. No woman of the dwarf folk was beridden. When the time of May feasting was at hand, Lud came, the dwarf chief, son of Froketh. With him, his daughter, the night haired Rada. The dwarf maiden came, well attended with young hagwomen. Her skin, like half ripe rose seed. Small faced, bee dimpled, bird eyed. Full haired to the knee, brown curdled. Fur shod and cloaked. With acceptable grace, she came as a worthy bride offering. Hers was the bracken bed. Fragrant grass mingled within. For three days, killin' the battle-blooded North Rider, the weary wanderer, the forest fighter, remained silent. His thoughts remaining within himself. But then he welcomed the trough plighter. He welcomed the dark maid, the non-beridden one of the dwarf men, for she was not unworthy of a true man. Spake Dark Lude This woman, the safeguarded daughter of a chief, has never been any man's plaything. Not for her, the bed of sand, the dance-ending gift. This is a true lady of the Elfingers. Of women in the land, none is above her. None exceeds her in beauty or virtue, if these you value. As man speaks with man, chief with chief, match gift with gift. Let this land be ours. Give me a tall, corn-haired maiden, full-bosomed, fair-skinned, sun-faced, to enliven gloomy lives. Spake one-tongued killin. Not for me, the words of hidden meaning. No maid of light shall be given to man of darkness, though dwarf maidens are not denied to men of mine. If night mingle with the day, the light is lessened, so the day spurns the night. The night is not guardian of the light, so what cares it? Does darkness put out the firelight? or fire dispel darkness? Can they mix? No milk-skinned maid shall go at my behest. This I declare. For even I cannot forbid the troth pledge of one who loves. If there be a milk-skinned maid who would freely choose to go, then let it be. She may bide as a bride of yours. But surely it is known no milk-skinned maid would sever herself from our race. For return with a dark brood is forbidden. No dark brood do we accept. Our men with your maids go, but what comes of it is not one of us. No acceptable issue of ours. We father no dark brood. Nor twilight offspring. What do we choose to father our herds? The best? Or the worst among bulls? Are not men many times greater than cattle? No milk-skinned maid came freely forth. The dark dwarf men chief was left unwed. In stockaded homes, the tall upright ones slept secure. No maid crept forth to mingle with the murky ones of the night. Yet when the full-sailed night scanner shone above, with weird prancing, the nethermen danced in the down-shining light. 
round and round. Rapidly moved the dancing feet. The earthen mound quaked. The singing rose on the night breeze. Flute music mingled with the tree sounds. Faster flew the nimble feet, beating down upon tight-packed earth. Wilder whirled the dancers to their coupling climax. The earth watchers drew a curtain of cloud over the eyes of the night shiner. No corn-haired head rose from its resting place. Many the moon-bathed dances. Oft the wild prancing. But less and less the dark brood's numbers. Further back into the forest and caves went the dusky-skinned ones. Oft in the night darkness, fair maids were snatched by brown-cowled dwarf men to breed twilight birdlings in secret places. Woeful were the enforced couplings, and woeful the issue. Not for milk-skinned maids. The free sinful coupling of the foredoomed dawn race. In five generations, the nethermen were gone. Only in the dark depths of cave and forest could they be found. No longer were the milk-skinned maidens molested at night. The night offerings were put out. The dwarf men came and supped. Honey, bread, milk, and south flesh were taken in gratitude. The race of nethermen passed into the shadows of time. Only twilight offspring roaming the land. Tawny-faced, blue-legged, weirdly painted. Brown-cowled rope-belted. Builders with stone. No longer dwellers in dismal caves. Or hunters in dark-mired swamps. The alfing built slime-covered bow houses and raised high, upward, pointing stones. Still sopa smeared, pig fat ointmented, like the dark side of their forebears. They were also feathered, and quill ornamented. Being twilight fathered, they faced no man courageously, coming to the attack like ground slithering snakes. Striking venomously, from secret places, still forest skulkers. None could recite his lineage, for no man knew his father. These were mother lap reared half folk, speaking with the tongues of their fathers. Their words, like crackling, spluttering green twigs, burning in the fire. Brown and green clothed, bee bangled. Stone hauling ijunings. Toiling for their black bearded masters, for unknown ends. The Book of Origins Chapter 3 The Flood Tale Over the sea, now called Besabramal, came a far-ranging race from Crocasus, the motherland where Gatuma ruled, where sky-reaching mountains rise out of a wide, green, dark-soiled plain. They were horse fighters, known among themselves as the Wildland Cultivators and they landed at the place, before times called, Haltraith. In the land of the horsefolk, now held by Angling. They built the woodwalled town, called Hoven Lee, in the New Tongue, near where the great sea king sleeps beneath his mound. They took their land from the herd-keeping Fralga, and ranged wide, from shore to shore. Renaming the water-encircled land, the honey-laden isle. For never before had they seen honey in such quantities since leaving their own land. There were folk here before the fleet-footed Fralga. But they were magic-dealing dwarfs, living in holes sunk in the ground. Covered over with wicker and earth. It is said they knew and understood the speech of all wild creatures and often talked with them as brothers. They were friendly and frolicsome, and before them only the bowed Yoshin roamed the land. In the days when the wildland cultivators came and swallowed up the Fralga, 
there were bears, wolves, wild cattle, boars, oryx, deer, elk, lion cats, man-eating water lizards, and beast-eaters that dwelt in lakes aplenty. The Fralga were not small, but lacked fighting skill. They were spearmen, and without bows, but skillful stone slingers. Behind the wildland cultivators came the Euxining. But being boatless, few came to this green land, most turning southward to Amorica. Those who came were workers in wood and metal. And it was they who built Kelna Hylene, which stood even in the generation of our grandfathers' fathers. In the generation when Glenapton was king of the wildland cultivators, a north spawned horde came down upon the flatlands, led by Baladon, the Thrumchind, who gained kingship over the land once called Kenningwed. Callwater, the son of Glenapton, married a daughter of Baladon. And Freywill, son of Baladon, married a daughter of Glenapton, and there was peace. It was in the generation of their sons that Benlanda, son of Bamlid, king of the Parsis, took the land. And all Britain moved southward. The southward moving folk established the places of their responsive gods where once other gods had been hallowed. And they took the place of Madrad. They took the lands of the cattle herding base Gala and the sea trading Tanning and out in sky-wide Sen Mag. They built the Great Hall of Karkil Jewel, with material carried from the Fan of Illusion during the cold half of the year. In their generation, people of this blood, the black-banded Kelglane built the wooded town of Merilivan, which stood until the coming of the longsword Helwarin. Its burning was a vile act of spite, following their bitter defeat at the harsh battle of Belishmer, when King Fadlamid was slain and honorably buried at Cumbergles by the British battle chiefs. It was the wildland cultivators who gave the flood tale to our house-building forebears, but the generation of its happening is lost. In those days, men were inclined to the ways of peace, and harvest followed winter without change. But it came about that looking up into a darkling night sky, they saw a strangely formed moon chariot overhead. It passed away into the rosy dawning of a newborn day. But then, at the night end of the sky roof, appeared the dread figure of a wamperred, revealing itself to the eyes of wondering men. It crawled out into the brightness. The foul breath of the nightcomer, newly sprung from the dark depths of its unearthly lair, spread across the brightening face of heaven like an evil gray veil. And even the ever fearless sun withdrew to gird himself in red war armor. The fast beating hearts of men first shriveled with despair at the fearsome sight, then rose while their throats responded with glad cries as the moon chariot came back over the dim horizon. There, riding the battle bar, flaming sword held high was the bright, beloved figure of Lithaluan. Her fair hair strung out behind as she flew towards the hell figure. They met in an awful, hell-echoing clash with the noise of ten thousand rolling thunders. And men bold enough to look were stricken with blindness. And uncovered ears were deafened forever. Cold moon tears were shed by the fangined, clawtorn, champion of mankind. While the hellish awamkor red drooled white cinders. Which, if they touched the skins of men below, raised evil wheels. The unearthly foemen fell apart and hurled great, self created rocks at each other. And onlookers below dashed for protective shelter as they howled down out of the sky above. The very earth, herself immovable, was sickened with fear. 
and her bowels became loosened with dread. Her belly trembled before the awful sight. Men, looking anxiously to their lord, the sun, were dismayed to see his constant change of war garb. From red to blue, then to yellow, then green, then brown. Good Mother Earth opened her ground mouth and roared ear-cracking protests, while her whole comforting body shook in fear under the gloomy battle shadow form above. Men and beasts were drawn together in a strange brotherhood of fear, none doing harm to another. Those hardy enough to maintain a watch on the combat saw the flashing chariot of Lithuluan crush the writhing body of the nightcomer, and then saw its vile black blood, thick like resin, fall upon the thankful bosom of earth. Where the blood fell, flames sprang up. The fear-heated, blood-despoiled body of Mother Earth was cooled and refreshed by the soothing moon tears of Lithuluan. Shed in womanly relief as she drove back towards her hidden abode in the recesses of heaven. This is the tale of the sky fight. But whether it happened before or after the generation of Hestabel and the flood tale, none now truly knows. It concerns the doom dragon, which has come more than once and will come again. And the last music mankind will hear is the shrill, throbbing notes of the doom song. This is the flood tale, which has come down to us from our house building forebears. And it happened in days generations ago, when men were widely divided. Out into the gray, watery wilderness where now the restless western waters roll and heave. There was a place called Turfula, meaning the far western land. It was a country of high mountains, higher by far than those known to us. And lo, green grass hills swept down from them to brown, fertile, plowed lands at the sea edge. The folk of Turfula lived in fine houses, though the roofs were flattened, built on cliff shelves and places high above the fertile valley floor. Ladders went up the side of the houses, for they were entered from the roof. The ways of other people are strange. They hunted the roving deer in open glade forests where there were no entangling brambles, and fished in quiet pools of gay, splashing rivers. They plucked the plentiful herbs, which grew in manifold variety, there being some for every known purpose. It was indeed a land of peace and plenty. The day came, as come it always must, whenever peace and plenty abide. For then, earth displays a defect in her instructiveness. When the soothsayers saw cokers in the night skies, but they were unable to agree among themselves as to what these portended. Some said this, and some that, while the wiser ones listened, saying nothing. The day came when sleeping earth awoke to a great silence and stillness, not a breath of air stirring the anticipating trees, and no bird left its perch and every animal remained quiet within its den or in the field. All was hushed and motionless, waiting. Then the soaring sun brought low moaning winds, which stirred the trees and grasses to rustling, murmuring life. But all living creatures huddled closer together. The sky roof above was darkened and lowered. It was ruddily hued, and gave out sharp, whip-cracking sounds, as though it would break asunder, with now and then a shrill, long-drawn cry. In heart-thumping procession, 
awesomely figured sky gods never before seen passed overhead. Men lived through two fierce struck, days of dread, not knowing what to expect. During which time, there was no true night. One heart-stopping sight, after another, passing before, their horror-filled eyes. When darkness did fall. It was not the restful night darkness, which soothes work-weary men, lulling them to revitalizing sleep. No, indeed. It was that form of darkness, known as the smothering cloak of Thuner. Though never before, had it spread so wide. Water streamed downward from the fountain spouts of the sky. Not as rain falls, but as water drops out from a pail upturned. Neither was it the pure, true rain. It was tainted with bitter blood from some strange battlefield in the vast sky spaces. And contained broken pieces of the rainbow. The sky roof itself was borne down to the very surface of the seething waters. And Mother Earth cowered beneath it as the shrinking field mouse cowers before the harvester's footfall. A vast, black cloud was drawn like a curtain across the sky roof, stretching from horizon to horizon. Rising above it were strange billows of flame and smoke. Though what the fire consumed, it is not possible to even guess. For all know, water does not burn. Then all things ceased movement. All was silent and still. A heavy, ill-boding, brooding silence. The stillness of heart-hammering fear. Then, with awful suddenness, came a high-wave wall of dark, white-fanged waters. Sweeping swiftly along, in fearsome irresistibility. It carried everything before it, as a broom sweeps the floor and accompanying it was a high-born note, long, drawn out. Behind it, upon the seething waters, all the fruits of the land, house debris, trees, bloated dead animals and humans floated upon the wild, wide waters. There was an earthy brown, foamy, scum, which drifted strangely over the surface. Not sinking, yet not like oil, for it was gritty. It was irregular and held together. It was like the scum on a fuller's tub. There was a great downpouring of rain, which stopped after seven days. Then the sky roof rose back into its proper place. And our fear-struck forebears saw once more the blessed light of day. They stood upon their drenched mountainsides and saw great trees, the like of which had never before been seen, float past. Hell-formed, hideous things came up from the depths and swelling burst on the surface. There were fearful sea monsters and great whirlpools, terrible things from unknown places. Wild creatures were washed about, dead or dying. The surging seas tore between the high mountains in great rip tides of dirty water. Standing on their hilltops, our frightened forebears saw the swimming house, made fast against the sea, come up to the land. And out from it came men and beasts from Turfula. It was built as a house on a high platform standing well above the waters. When they had landed and made themselves secure, the black Raymond strangers built a tall tower of stone, upon which they kept an ever-burning fire to honor the gods who brought them to safety. It was said that if the fire ever went out, the waters would rise again. Upon the surging waters was another wave-tossed craft, the great brim of Hestabel, the wild wave-wanderer, 
Slayer of Nycteron the Water Beast Worker of strange metals, who married Newlin of Wongwilt, daughter of Manwadin, far famed for her beauty. For her hair outdid the yellow of the celandine. Her skin was softer than down, and whiter than the mayflower. Her lips were the red of strawberries, and her bosom, soft as the windflower. She exuded the sweet perfume of new mown hay. The son of Hestabel was the temple protecting, three-spirited Ezers. Who made his home in the great oak? Where to this day he is worshipped as the god of beer and greenery. The tale tellers are not at ease with Hestabel and Ezers. Whether they were gods or men. But in some men, the division is not clear. Perhaps gods are made by the regard of men. Please remember to subscribe, like, and comment. The Book of Origins, Chapter 5, Workers in Metal There are, in this land, two tribes of smith workers and metal forgers. And one is the Merkings, who remain among the Quicta. And they tell a tale of a flight from the west, where their forebears lived in painted abodes, cut out of rocks. It is now the land of Manon, and close to men by the waters above. For it burst asunder at the bowels, streaming out through Lin Leon, during a great night of darkness. So it is, that these others who work with metal, worship spirits who dwell beneath the sea. They do not worship gods as the quick did do, and still cast food upon the waters. But they do have god beings, which are less than gods, and worship these, calling them Haspa, Yelpa, and Tiz. They acknowledge Blazes and leave offerings to Nana. Oxen are sacred beasts to them, and they do not eat the flesh of geese believing them to contain the souls of women. Yet they eat the flesh of boars, though believing these have been entered by the souls of men. But they do not eat this, except with solemn ceremony. Once, though no longer, their chiefs were not succeeded by their sons, as now. But brother succeeded brother by the mother. Then, Succession was by the mother's daughter's son. In the days, before Umpopal was the great chief, wives were the property of all men of the household. It was not until after the coming of those who followed Lugad the bronze finder that many changed their ways. After Lugad came, the dead were no longer buried in the old manor. Nestled in boughs and stones. They were laid out straight, heads to the west, with their comforting objects and oak boughs, as is done today. These other metalworkers learned their craft from Yasus, otherwise called Hastabel, though some say they were two and brothers. He came, boat born, with the other children. Re and Mag, called Maya, who became his wives. For their father had cast them afloat at the time of the land sinking. This is not a tale known to us, and not being ours is not well understood. They were fortunate to escape the underwater dwellers, who lurk in the depths to snatch seafarers down to destruction. We have heard many tales of our times concerning the Burn Kraken which drags seacraft down to destruction in all the four seas of Britain. Yasus was saved by the people of the Bear and became their chief. But they married among the dark Feymen and became as they are today. These people were disliked because of their ways, but were not shunned. No king ever molested our forebears for they threatened no one and served all alike. They went freely from place to place with their hearts, 
We're law-abiding folk and not land-hungry. Our people held safe the secrets of metals. Though later, they were opposed by the sons of May when they came. For these feared, the knowledge held fast. Though given high estate among the quits. Our people do not make swords for the black brood of the north. It is the same quits who have given land which the wanderers do not need. Our people first came to this land through Pakatha. And even now have great houses at Karbaska. The others came across the water from Ablana. But the generation of their coming is unknown to any here. This chapter is from parts reconstructed. The two tribes of metalworkers were the sons of fire. And those who were called Merkings. The Book of Origins, Chapter 6 The Tale of Hugh Great Hugh, the strong arm, chief of the well-born ones, was bright-bearded, blue-eyed, but not over-tall. He was the bronze-bound ruler of warriorful Hefa, a place lying out in the shallow seas eastward of Britain, with a many-moted, white castle, and high-colored walls. This was the seat from which he ruled off flooded Edifrabandi, gaining control not by the sword, but through marriage with the corn-haired daughter of Quatana. He faff lay off the bay called Argist, over the sea called Mortosh, and the people thereabouts were the Kadira. They were war-wise, and learned in other ways. But their week was too long, by two days. After the arrival at Salmanth, to which he came peacefully, as a bridegroom, to his waiting bride, Hugh became king of the Cathon, and he taught men to plow and till the soil. He crossed to the Summerland, where he set up a great school of learning. And there was first taught the writing of books in the trees. The brother of Hugh was that Torun, who took men of Hefa across the sea to Lador. The fighting folk who came with Hugh were outstanding among others, being fair headed, light eyed, soft spoken, tall and slim, upright. Big muscled, honorable, brave, and musical. Yet they were not of the first faith, and spurned the old faith, nor were they with us. But they were akin to the true folk of this green isle, and kindred to the brave ones across the land bound sea. They were not stone builders, though they rebuilt sky bound Morgravit. The great gate hall which the Dark Ones call Shindikra even to this day. This is the Hall of the Horse Stones. This is the tale of Hugh, the strong-armed wielder of the man's mitre, child of the Aryan, which was given to us by our house-building forebears. But the days of this generation are lost. It concerns the Aram with whom he fought who were the famen of other times. Hugh of the sun-filled heart, lithsome as the willow, sturdy as the oak, fair-skinned, blue-eyed, straight-tongued, peace-minded, not strife-seeking, yet war-wise. This was he who led the glory-gleamer folk, he gave merry life to the green-grassed heart of Britain. Flower-meadowed, sparkling-streamed, water-veined. He brought to these sand-bangled shores the high-hearted race of iron-muscled, horn-handed, freemen. He, the son of Woodgirt Fields, first turned the sod of Britain in hill-tearing brown furrows. 
Upon the high slopes, he made the soil to be uplifted, overturning it upon the winter-held grain. He first brought the long ox-drawn field rakes and carried fertility to the pasturelands. Winters were no longer times of hunger. For now, all ate, without stint, from hide-line cellars filled with fire-dried corn. Cabbages and Onions Peas and gill gift. Forest gleaning of womenfolk grew in tended soil. Staked plots in the forest glades. Cattle gifts of cheese and curd cake. Fire dried flesh of summer fattened beasts. Nuts and brown herbs were the winter fare. Men wandered freely from place to place, woodwending paths, directing their feet. Patient beast back bore the handiwork of men in bursting hide bags. Never were the ever welcome wanderers waylaid with evil intent. On stout hued house pillars, sheath swords slept in silent companionship with decorative shields. The old ones slept beside glowing hearts. Contented the women folk, happy the children. Peaceful the hefty, wide-handed, brief-bearded men. They had found Castira and were content. Warm clothed against the winds of winter. Hide head dressed. Black cloaked. Long tunicked. Breast belted. Kartak ornamented. They lacked little for content. The summer pourer of the rainbow smiled over fertile, flowering pastures. Playgrounds of mirthful maids. On green carpets, the young ones skipped to the maiden wakening dance. Flute-playing youths and clapping singers gathered around the herbrew pails. Oft told the old tales. Oft sung the songs of yore. Not for these, the earth hold house the bee-waddled roof covering. High raftered, the roofs over the eating hall. Broad beamed, the guest hall. High raised, the host hall. Sturdy timbered, the roof holding posts. Hide hung, shielding the slumber rooms. Bracken bench beds gave restful repose to toilers of the day. Twelve was the number of the councilmen. Wise, the judgments given by the wisp-haired, hoary-headed, bronze-bangled ones. Who sat on the oak trunk seats? These were the times when days received their names. And weeks, their numbering. The coming of the moon was made known. And daylight was divided into four parts. The three parts of night were named, and the two times of eating. Men knew the four divisions of the year, and their names were known. Much landed Hugh taught the mating of the golden faced sky spirit with the Lady of Life. Their son, the godling of greenness, was never unknown in the sea necklaced land. He was the never tiring teacher of truth. But this was not he whom the Britons worship. That one being not a man, but an invisible spirit. Before Hugh, folk saw at night only by the ruddy illumination of firelight or its child, the flaming firebrand. But he gave them fat lamps, feeding on the floating residue of flesh. Not yet light from the bee. Not yet were the fiery forges set up in this land by brawny, brown-eyed smithmen. Their squat, four-wheeled work wains, ox-drawn through forest ways. Peaceful. The lush, green land. Peaceful all that dwelt between surging seas. From Pertain, the fine bright bronze work, the big-bellied pots. From Longaset. The hides and hornwork, the work of strange smiths. From the Lyke, 
earth-hidden things, borne away in far-faring boats. From Setnaspor, the hard sharp stone tools, the ripe corn cutting knives. Yearly, from the Aram, at Haraganos, came the tribute of murky maids. Mothers of the stud brood. Workers with hillside herds and forest feeders. Gatherers of wood and fruits. Never had the tribute been withheld. Well were the Aram instructed. Enoch the collector, chooser of bright-eyed murky maidens, came always with the best-fitting ones for mothering the stud brood. What of Wenda? Non-beridden daughter of Orma, troth pledged to Lopic the black-bannered chief. She of the flower-garlanded, throng-gathered, unbraided hair. Small-breasted, small-handed. Delicately wiry-bodied. Rowan-cheeked, somber-eyed. Who spoke of her to a knock, who told of her beauty. Her ever-smiling lips, her wit, her wisdom. She was unfound among the gathering. The hagmaids gazed long at Enoch's behest. Into the full, moon-enlightened waters. But she was unseen there. Orma was taken. And all the hagwomen. Every maid and every youth. Neck-bound, they were brought to the stud hall unharmed. They were fed and bedded. In the night darkness, the wolf wretches came. Evil weapons struck silently. Sleepers died. Vulnerable backs took fanged barbs. Dectire, child daughter of Arden, was snatched for foul bewitchment. A sacrifice to Gallo. Victim of the bloodletting hagmaidens. Through the wide pastures, the hawk banner bearers sped. Forests echoed the horn blasts. The brand bearers' cries were heard afar. Large the council called gathering in the field of the stone circle. And when the shaft cast was counted, all cried out for blood. High spirited, stallion mounted Hugh. Swift smiter, girded at waist. Bright bronze mason hand raised the winged war banner. And harsh, the heart gripping war cry from a thousand ensavaged throats. Bright the gleaming bronze blades. The slim, sharp spearheads. The weighty man maulers. Forward the hefty, oak hearted warriors eager eyed for battle. Tall, apple ash wooded, the hill summit where the folk horde of Brim stood. No timbered stockade builders, these would skulkers. Sharp staked, wildly pitted, the approach. Low stone walled. The last defense of the earth ruiners. The summer shiner was halfway down to his trysting place with earth. Fast flew the hell balls of stone. The soft singing death bringers flung by the foul fighters. Lopic, the loud mouthed boaster, shrieked loud against the shield sheltering stalwarts. Fast flew the hook toothed blades with poison sting of death. Safe were the throwers from the stallion led horse charge. Never ceasing was the downfall of slingshot stones. Loud were the shrill shrieks of the wild haired hagwomen. Black garb, besmirched with sacrificial blood. No tongue of man used they. Wolf yelps, howls, and cat cries tore the air. Then the shields lifted and came forward. The bright blades gleamed redly. The pain bringers arrived among the Aram. Heavily the bloodied man maulers fell, smashing through shield and bone, wielded by oak like arms. Loud the cries of the Aram. Long, linden shafted, red rammers, thrust forward. The barbed dart was of no avail. Within the wood, 
Wicker shielded Lopic, tree head, stood to thrust the poison barb. As the skulking stoat springs upon its prey, bare fang to kill. The foul fighter leapt upon the battle wearied warrior, brother of Dactyre. Deep sank the evil barbs before the ash shaft broke. But Lopic was within reach, carried forward by furious thrust. Loud the thud of the full falling battle hammer, biting deep into the encrushed brow, unavailing the leathern protector. This was a vermin slaying. Gone were the hagwomen and nethermaids to their gloomy abode. Far through the forests ranged the vengeance fighters. Many the bloodied bodies of Aram left behind. Then in wooded glade, battle-weary eyes beheld a maiden figure. Wenda. Not over-fearful, nor over-bold. Small beneath the tall trees, hooded, caped and kilted. None stood with her except a two-tongued hagwoman cowering against a tree trunk. Silently, curiously, the sleepless, weary Aram fighters gathered. Here was a self-given peace pledge. A ransom for faint-hearted fighters. A deed not unworthy of those to whom she came. No gallant, generous heart could not accept. Tiny indeed was she before the great hue. Here was no stud mother, but one worthy of being a true wife. No man indeed, he who would accord her less. It was Lyre, grandson of Wenda and Olva, who built the first house on the place where walled London now stands. These are the sayings of Wenda the Wise. The woods are havens for the heavy-hearted, for trees soak up sadness. The lofty trees, sheltering sheet of forest dwellers, whisper soothing words to the worried. The only true friend is the tongueless tree. The most painful ills are the heart's mining ones. Therefore, never leave it unshielded. A high-sounding title is a poor woodwaif unless it is parented by eminent virtues. The treetops bow in homage to the winter winds. Forest creatures are lean, and sheep no longer graze on the summer pastures. Woe to him, say the whistling winds, who sacrifices his honor for worldly gain. The chill arrows of winter cleave the fall air. Within the home, a warm fire and low conversation is pleasant. But much talk unguards the tongue. And to dishonor a confidence is the sign of weakness. The brow of the hill is white with snow. And wild birds search diligently for food. Squirrels sleep soundly, dreaming of nut hoards. The wind whistles through the wall's wickerwork. Then call to mind that when winds of adversity blow, the fire of friendship comforts. But prefer to be a fire tender, not a fireside squatter. Having no feelings, the fish is chaste. What claim to virtue has a woman, chaste as a fish? As a bench bride's love, flowers in dark corners. Can sweetness be anticipated from its fruits? The woman, surrendering to a true man, has become a conqueror. No lover of children, the bench bride, or she would not act as she does. The bench bride's love is consummated in darkness. For darkness is the befriender of shame. Tarnished or inferior love sold cheaply. 
That is the bench bride's bargain. The Book of Origins Chapter 7, Tale of Guinevere Because they are incomplete. Four Tales Of Helen the Sun-Faced Of Lavid the Fool and the War King Of the Three Spear Kings And of Helen Blodod and the Golden Chariot have been omitted. This is the tale of Guinevere as it has come down to us and to we who reconstruct it. The task is not easy, for the pages are torn in several parts. The tale is told how, back in the bygone days, when gods walked the earth, they made the first woman in this manner. They prepared a vessel, shaped by the future desires of men, placing into it these things. The gleam of sunlight mixed with the yellowness of ripe corn. This became her hair. The cold, clear dawn dew mixed with the hue of the violet. This became her eyes. The pale radiance from the moonbeam mixed with down from the neck of a swan. This became her brow. The red from the cherry mixed with the color of mayberries. This became her lips. The whiteness of the snowflake, mixed with a mayflower's purity. This became her bosom. They took the sparkle from running waters for her smile, and the cooing of a dove for her voice. The heat from the fire to fill her passion, and the edge from the sword to arm her tongue. From the core of a flint worked keenly. They made her mind. And from the fall of a snowflake, they made her touch. To this they added a blended mixture of extracts. From the playful cruelty of the cat, the dancing lightness of the sunbeam's notes, the flutter from the wings of a butterfly, the song of the nightingale, the industriousness of the bee, the gentleness of a mouse, the softness of a rabbit, and the shiver of an aspen tree. If this were a god-made woman, then Guinevere was a product of their hands. But did these gods not try to keep this woman for themselves? As being something too good for man? But man, in his brave audacity, stole her, and she became the great woe maker. Truth is embedded in the old tales for the wise to find and use as they will. When the mother of Guinevere was in child labor, her father, the battle chief Kumwa, was at the festive board. And as was the custom, he called upon the soothsayer to foretell the future. The soothsayer told his lord that the woman child now approaching the veil would grow to be the most beautiful woman in the land, but would be the death of many men, including her own brother, the war chief's only son. These words ate at the heart of Kumwa. He asked the wise soothsayer what should be done to avert disaster. And the crafty one answered that he would seek advice among the stars. Not all soothsayers had a temple of truth in their hearts. It happened that the voice of Helva, son of Kumla, lived in the ear of the seer. So when the report was given at mid-morn the following day, it was a lengthy woe foretelling, much disturbing to the heart of Kumla. What was the outcome? The soothsayer spoke long and Kumla's heart ached for his only son and for the mother. But his duty was to protect his son, the heir born of his youth, and he could put his daughter to death according to the manner of the times. As a high-born woman's blood could not be spilt among green-growing things, 
for this would blight the land. And only a simpleton could not be hurt by the deed. Guinevere was given to the battle chief's fool. He was to take her outside the boundary of the land and there drown her. His payment for the deed being the wish-granting urn. Called Hellwed, no small reward. The kind-hearted fool had little liking for the deed. His heart was heavy. And the aspect carried, cradle child, so contentedly lovely that the fool's load of sadness grew increasingly heavy. So they went on. The kindly fool and the lovely young one. Until they came to the great, gloomy, forest of Keliabans lying beyond Dunmerkill. The fool and his ass load kept on through the forest. For thought he, where else can I go? As well here as any other place. It is in keeping with my heart. Deep in the forest. Just before, the stars opened their eyes. They came upon a small, stream-traversed glade. And there, nestling among the woodweed, was a tumble-down, half-house. The fool blew the wayfarer's horn, and there came a small, shy forest man. First, cautiously, peeping around the doorpost, then timidly approaching. Had it been anyone other than a gaudy-garbed fool, the small one would have fled. But these forest-farers were taken in and made welcome in the humble hut. Later, the forestmen's brothers came back from their foraging, and there was much lively chatter. For among such folk, the fool did not feel out of place. He stayed for three days, and it was agreed that the forest men should take the little one from him and take care of her. What else could they do? For forest men are gentle and kind-hearted. Were they not, they would never have been confined to the forest. What else could the fool do? If he could not bring himself to put the little one to death, what better place to leave her? The ugly forest men raised fair Guinevere with tenderness. They were wise in their way. And because they did not want her to become vain and immodest, or perhaps because they did not want her to discover how different she was. There was nothing in the forest home in which she could see her face. Knowing about the soothsayer's foretelling, they let her think she was ugly too. Or was it because they really wished her to be one of them? Did they not know that love closes the eyes to defects? Her own loveliness was unknown to Guinevere. Her playmates were the wild creatures of the forest. Fawns, rabbits, and squirrels played outside her door. And the wise badgers came to protect her at dusk. Wrens and robins were her constant companions. In summer she bathed in sparkling rill waters. And garlanded herself with wild flowers. Wood bells and primroses grew everywhere. In winter, she sang through the berry-bearing glades and gathered fallen kindling wood under the great trees. She slept on a bed of sweet moss under cozy coverlets of fur. She drank the pure stream waters flowing through the cooking place and ate fish and the plentiful forest fruits. Her garments were woven from fine forest flax and soft down. Her mantle was made of white winter fur. Her long, bamp braided hair took its color from the water marigold. Yet in all her forest-bounded childhood, Guinevere never had a companion of her own age, or saw any mortal being other than the forest men. It happened that when the forest maiden had grown to young womanhood and it was midwinter, huntsmen from the wood castle of the king came into the naked forest seeking boars for the Yule feast. They came upon the rough forest home of fair Guinevere. 
and she, not knowing who or what they were, acted like a frightened wren. They did her no harm, not knowing whether she were mortal or spirit, but went away marveling that the gloomy forest could contain such beauty. Such a tale could not long await the telling. And men argued among themselves as to whether a wood spirit had been seen or a mortal. Wood sylphs were known, but rarely sighted. It happened that the tale came to the ear of Helva. And he, lacking neither courage nor curiosity, wished to lead men into the forest to hunt the maiden, be she spirit or mortal. But first, as all wise men do before going on a quest, he sought the advice from the soothsayer. The soothsayer, gazing into his scribal, saw the beauty of Guinevere and knew who she was. And knew too that never could Helva venture into the forest. Nor would he be safe while Guinevere lived. Now, though the fool who had taken the lovely maid to the forest was dead, he had, before dying, unburdened his heart to the mother of Guinevere, and she had kept the secret locked in her breast. Now she decided to go to the forest and warn her daughter lest any harm befall her. For she doubted not but that there would be a hunting through the treefast depths, making suitable excuses for her absence. She disguised herself as a woodman's wife, and with a young attendant who had been one of the boar hunting party set out for the forest. The soothsayer, with two companions, also departed for the forest, all being disguised as men of the peddling tribe. And because those with him were experienced in forest ways, it was the soothsayer's party which arrived first at the hut glade. Guinevere was alone, for the forest men were hewing in the ground. And these, being the first strangers she had seen, she took fright, evading them among the trees. From which shelter, she nervously peered out. While the soothsayer tried to entice the maiden to Tari, the youngest of the forest men, having hurt his hand, came into the glade. The soothsayer's companions seized him, and the maiden's concern overcame her fears. Rushing to his aid, she was taken also. But no harm was done to her. For those with the old man were disarmed by her beauty. He, seeing this, put on the face of guile. And acted as would a true peddling man. They bartered the usual wear of peddlers. Cloth, brooches, beads. Pins, salt, earthenware, dyes. Knives, sweetmeats, cords and flints, taking soft pelts and fruit of the ground. Before leaving, the soothsayer gave Guinevere, as a parting gift for a lovely maiden, a sweetly perfumed ointment and a mouth-watering cake, both infused with deadly poison. The cake she left, small and tempting though it was, she wished to share it. But the perfumed ointment she could not resist, and it was a womanly thing. Barely had the forest maiden used it when the forest men returned. They were early, but heavy rain clouds threatened. Delightedly, the new bought wares were displayed, one by one. But surprised joy diminished to silence as Guinevere grew more and more tired. Her head at last, falling onto the table. The forest men picked her up and carried her to the bed place. As they did so, there was a knocking on the door. It was the mother of Guinevere. They let her in, and the thunderstorm broke full overhead. The speech of the forest men was not easy on the ears. Their chattering was overcome by the downpour. But the mother of the sleeper knew what had happened. The cake she threw on the fire. 
The sleeping maid she took in her arms, carrying her out into the thunderstorm. Behind the hut she stripped her, and with moss and mud, rubbing hard, removed the ointmentation. Round and round the glade she walked the small kilted maid. Around and around, never stopping. Talking, prodding, lifting, smacking. Stumbling together. Falling and getting up. Slithering on rain-wet moss, bedraggled, muddied and scratched. On tirelessly, until final collapse. The forest men helped the exhausted women inside. And the elder made them make hot brews for the still sleepy maiden. Her feet were placed in a wood tub of hot water, and she was seated by the fire. Later, the two women were bedded down together. And in the morning, the forest maiden woke up well. They broke fast with goat broth. But the mother of Guinevere could not dally over long. Nor could the maiden remain with the forest men. For surely the huntsmen would come again. So a grave place was made. Ringed round with stones, and a mound raised. But no maid slept beneath the mayberry bush. Guinevere left the forest. Her long fair hair beneath a leathern cap. Coarse cloth covering her body. A distant herdsman's home gave her shelter. It happened that the herdsman had two sons. One a hefty, hard-handed, wide strider, fond of brawling. The other, a small-handed fireside dreamer, deft but not overstrong. The first was named Bagot and the other Darren. It was only days before Bagot was smitten with the beauty of Guinevere. But she, knowing not the ways of men, treated him with friendliness and kindness. He, thinking she was being coy and teasing him after the manner of irresponsible women, tried to take her when she was gathering eggs at the herrick. She fled to the house and the good wife and Darren within. Bagot became moody. He sulked the day long and neglected his work. And when once he came on Guinevere alone, he was overcome. He told her that unless she gave herself to him, he would be riding towards the woodcastle on a money-making errand. She said, Then having no love for me, what ails you? He rode away. Now, it happened that the soothsayer had looked into his scribal and seen the grave place in the forest. But looking again, days later, he saw Guinevere seated on a tussock, carding wool, and he knew she lived. He sent men to dig at the grave place, and it gave up its secret. Forest men were brought in and put to the mouth-opening test. But they knew nothing of where she was, and could say nothing to lessen their suffering. So when Bagot arrived with his tail, the soothsayer knew who was being described as having hair yellower than broom flowers, skin whiter than driven snow, hands fairer than blossoms of wind flowers, eyes brighter than a falcon's, bosom more snowy than a swan's breast, and cheeks redder than mayberries. Men were sent with Bagot to capture such beauty. But Beauty had flown, accompanied by Darren, and sought sanctuary with Pentersil, king of the Howen, child of the landholdingers. And this was the cause of the bitter war, which made men scarce in the land. For Helva assembled his war bands, and entered the lands of Pentersil, who met him at the place called Rathcalder even today. We have reconstructed the tale as found. But here, some part is missing. Though account of the battle remains. The chariot clove through failing ranks. Through the drooping spears of the weary spearmen. 
through the ground-resting shields of the swordsmen, through the gasping forefighters, through the bloody-bodied lines of the axe-swingers, behind the tossing, red-eyed heads of the white horses, gold-gilded reins loosely held in one hand, and small, bright, ash-shafted spear firmly held in the other. Golden hair, unbraided, streaming behind her, held back from her face by the golden headguard. Her brilliantly brooched cloak, flapping like the wings of some heavenly battle bird. Guinevere sped towards the still-standing bodyguard about Helva. No arrow touched her. No sling stone came against her body. She was like a battle goddess. On the slope, between reed-bordered river and tree-crowned hill, the warbands of Helva made their last death-awaiting stand. Then it was all over, and the battlefield foragers did their work. So the tale of the delicate, forest-raised maiden who became a rage-driven war goddess, and of Darren, who became war-wise in one night, is one oft told in the feast halls. The Book of Origins Chapter 8 The First Faithbringers Once, wherever there was grass, there too was the old faith. For it could be contained within no particular domain. They who believed the things it taught were little-minded men. Unthinking receptacles for strange tales. With the first faith came better men, adopted sons of Britain, pre-tan, and the axe-wielding Baruts. And it was he who named this land the great white goddess of the cow-feeding pastures. The Baruts learned the sea lore from the Chaisite who first ventured out upon the salt waters. But their homeland is not known. Some say it was Rimvidi, west of the Lodgrains, but no man knows for sure. The Lodgrains, who bowed to the great milk giver, came later. The first faith came only as a babe. It was here that it grew to maturity, schooled at Inisquin. Those of the first faith respect trees even today, few though they are. But the true nature of the green god, who gives life and fertility to all green growing things, is unknown. They called trees the flutes of the great holy one, yet did not believe, as we do, that trees contain within themselves part of the life-giving force of mankind, pouring out good and absorbing its evils. They did not understand that without trees to mediate for man between the life force and the death force. He could not live. Yet now even, we are wiser. Knowing the green god of life is not in trees alone. They of the first faith made sacrifices at most of the proper times. But instead of leaf crowns, they wore masks in the likeness of sun and moon, believing them to be the rulers of omens. They worshipped in error the malignant horn star and her escorts fearfully seeking to turn them away. Instead of the wort mound, they used Gularinth to set up the sun-measuring daypole. But this offended the shadows. They failed even to do this properly, setting up a new pole every year instead of every seven. They did not treasure the soil from the pole circle as we do that from the mound. The sons of May Instructors in the first faith were not all wise. Seeking signs of the future, otherwise clearly seen, in ashes, bird flights and bloody, twisting entrails. They knew the making of a draft of forgetfulness from herbs. And the draft of sorrow from berries. Also, the making of dradspun, which lightens the heavy heart. They did not, as we do, judge wholly by known laws but oft made trial by using a magic collar. This was first dipped in water, 
blessed with cold fire, they then believing, it would choke the guilty one. This is not for us. For are we not told, man cannot avoid the responsibility for formulating laws, to try his fellow men, and rules to govern his life? These things cannot be thrown back onto higher authority. They hold one day in seven holy to the creating God whom they worship. In a transparent temple where the sun falls upon the heads of the worshippers. So there are many differences between the first faith and the Gwidinad. We worship in holy places built of stone or in caverns using open spaces only for the Midsummer Festival. In the first faith, the womanly maiden wed was always preserved for battle chiefs and the sons of May, who could claim it without dispute except among themselves. With this, we are not in accord. For women are not to be lightly treated. And a maiden wed is something kept for a husband a woman's pledge of purity, and to the well-being of the race. The sons of May were not lacking in courage, for they were ever in the forefront of battles, though they were mare riders, never mounting upon stallions. Every one of the sons of May had to be trained in the use of spear and sword even as we, but they had to know many songs and long lineages and be word-makers. They had long, unmusical songs, which were given out, with many gestures. The sons of May could claim no tribe as their own, for they were tribeless. They could not avenge any harm done to their kinfolk. And were any one wronged, his kinfolk could not avenge him. This was not because any one of the sons of May was ever renounced by his kinfolk, or they by him, but because of the power of his maidom. Whatever his circumstances, like us, a son of May, could never refuse hospitality. In battle, he always kept his face towards the foe. Like us, he was always respectful in the presence of women folk, never raising his voice to loudness or speaking lewdly. This is in accord with our laws. The bride price was forbidden to the sons of May. Like us, the sons of May had to prove their manliness. And if one had not done this on the battlefield, he was put into a forest, unarmed. And hunted by armed men, which is not our custom. If any man defamed one of them, he could be challenged to combat on the grove field by their combat champion. The sons of May dressed differently to our coals. Though now, all this has passed away. Never more to be seen by the eyes of mortal man. They wore a garment of crossed green and brown thread. Sometimes with yellow, blue or red interwoven. And this reached halfway between knee and ankle. Two necklaces of gold, bound together, and a headdress of white, bound about the head. An apron of finely tanned leather, and a cloak of coarse linen. Gold, low-hanging earrings. For their rights, they wore a white undergarment, with a fur-trimmed over frock, fastened with gold brooches. Upon their feet were sandals of fox fur. The chief among them would wear a diadem of gold, set with smokestones and rainstones. All shaved the hair in the front half of the head, so they were called big faces. The sons of May preferred to live in forests, but not in the depths, if possible. Beside a lake or water. Though no lake was holy to them, as some are to us. They had holy trees. And like our trees of power, these had to be beside a well or drinking pool. They had talking trees. But we do not understand these. Then more wells and pools contained the essence of Krishura. And those drinking hung some portion of clothing on the well tree. B. 
because so many failed to make the rounds of the waters. Much of the power has now gone. Or perhaps it is because the waters have become metal poisoned. Who knows? In Britain, the two folk beliefs of Celtica met and merged. And though before times, they had been mutually hostile. Later, they could no more be separated than milk and water shaken up together in a jug. So throughout the land, there were now two peoples. Those who came before the Celts and were children of this land. And the people of Celtica who traveled much on water and lived near rivers and lakes. The small statured dark folk favored the deep forest and high hills. Different from both were the painted people who lived largely on herbs. The language of the pre-people was rarely spoken, being the tongue of slaves and wayfarers, men who wandered. To the west, the people spoke the tongue of foreigners. To the east, they spoke Brythonic. And to the south, Limini. In the south, below the white lands of Albany, there were marshes. Among the dark strangers who came to these hospitable shores were men from Greece, who because they were exiled by their king, though for what we do not know, sought refuge in this bountiful land. They came in high proud craft, long-boarded, roofed over the center, with many long-bladed oars thrust out through high-bound, rowing outlets. The emblems they bore were the red eagle and snake, and they called the faraway place from whence they came Philistus, which means readily hewed land, so called from the color cast by a huge cloud through which their sun always shone. They spoke a wildish babbling tongue, so difficult that unless spoken slowly, could not be understood even among themselves. Their god was a huge, many-hued stone, which when placed on their strange altar, kindled the wood of the offering by its own power when light fell upon it from the eye of heaven. Men who have seen it say that the stone comes out cold from the midst of the fire. They wore garments of woven cloth and leather fastened with metal work, open shoes on their feet and flat hats marked with red and purple. These colors have some virtue among them which we cannot understand. They built five busy trading ports in Britain, the largest being Donardcath with a great haven for sea craft. The safe haven was encompassed by a high embankment and beyond a lower one, and a ditch enclosed their fields and cattle. The only one of these safe havens remaining is Karkal. All the others have gone. These Greeks were men of many skills. They knew things unheard of before in this blessed island. Thus, when they first arrived, Kaswalan, king of the Welsh, hastened to make them welcome. He willingly granted them all the land thereabouts for their own use, so they were not humble vassals, but men who lived in free alliance with the people. When the land-giving pact was solemnized, at a great glen gathering, the daughter of the Greek chieftain, Jezel, Bethamine, by name, renamed the Spendu, was betrothed to Cuin, son of Caswallon, to pledge the alliance. The Greeks took wives from among the Celtic women, for they had only two Greek women among them. The other being she who became Wraith, the sister of Thespendu. She was a holy maiden pledged to their god, and at all times she was guarded by two strangely armed dwarfs. It was told of her that her soft touch cured the sick, and her holy hand healed all but the most grievous wounds. It was said that Caswallon sent his hunchback servant to be healed of a sickness, and that he returned walking tall and straight as a young pine tree. A foolish woman, 
who fell through the roof while thatching, and split her stomach open on the loom post, was healed by washing in water made holy in the hand of Wraith. The last high priest of the first faith was Iphananud, called Chris Nicol, better known among the strangers as Kelwine. It is said, in truth, that he was the wisest of men. And his is the protecting spirit which hovers over the twelve green pastures of Britain. He is buried in the west at Carhen. He was the son of that Owen Bartha, who died of shame. And Olwen Kisabeg, his wife. At that time, the most beautiful woman in Britain. Daughter of Tishila and granddaughter of Marilyn, who ran away to Dunvarmid. We are told, and what brave Britain doubts it, that when she fled from Carcelog, all the sparrows left their nest building to accompany her, and songbirds flew in a protecting cloud above her bronze-bound chariot. It was on that tragic day that the great protecting spirit of Britain left the Holoselder with all his retinue. Since then, he has never returned. And the once, far-famed place is now the dead and dismal abode of a dradwitch. The wheels of life turn and turn, and the pride and integrity, the honest dealing man with man, the cherishing of womanly ideals, and the code of conduct for man and woman, will return to those in whose veins flows the blood of old Celtica. Great gods, old and new, hasten the day. There is but one God. But men view him differently through their own deceptive eyes in many aspects. And he appears to them to be many. The Book of Origins Chapter 9. The Battle Book. When I was a lithe, black-haired young warrior, rejoicing in the springtime flush of man's strength, Aristolio was a veteran battle captain. This was the spirit-strengthening war code he taught, long ago in the glorious fighting years of my virile youth. In a far-off, fertile motherland within the warm central sea. He rightly told us we need not overconcern ourselves with the strange ways of the high ones of heaven. Let the hidden gods fight their own somber battles in their wonderfully mysterious ways. For men, the grim earthly battles, closer here below, are sufficiently bitter. These we thankfully win or grudgingly lose according to our courage and fortitude, our discipline and training, our skill at arms and tactical cunning. Such needful qualities and essential skills we learn from our own war tutors, though some befitting things they do not teach. And wars are not won by material armaments alone. To complete the equipment of a sturdy fighting man, Something more is required. And to this end, these instructions are given. There are four codes to live by, each befitting the peculiar circumstances of the time. They are the code of the warrior, the code of the citizen, the code of the kinsman, and the code of the individual. There is the code of women, but that is something exclusively theirs, and something which all true men uphold. Among all men, the bloodied warrior is the most important, for he alone is the guardian protector of the things. Whatever they may be, all men value. None can have and hold any cherished belief or valued possession except by the grace of the sharp-edged weapon in the strong right arm, and the sturdily protective shield on the left arm. He pledges something no other man can exceed in value. His throbbing lifeblood. 
Each grim warrior is a loving and compassionate mother's son. And his war training starts in her protective arms. She never neglects him. And every care is given to ensure his contentment. A nervous mother conveys nervousness with her breast milk. She withholds from her man-child the basic warrior nourishment. As he grows beyond her tender arms, she must see in her small man-child the bloodied warrior of the heroic future years. He must not be pampered. He must be taught confidence and self-reliance with his first faltering steps. She must bear in mind that in the four ranks of the battle array, every man stands supported or betrayed by his mother, according to her handling of him in the forming first years of his growing. The questioning man-child grows towards the restless youth, and the foundations for the fullness of manhood are laid down firmly or otherwise. The youth takes weapons and having been battle-blooded, becomes a man. The man is not only brave. He is heroic, for courage resides in all men, no matter how mean-minded. He is well-knit in body. He stands tall. And his eye and hand are steady. Straightforward, keen-looking, stern-faced. He stands steadily still and moves with each foot striking the ground, as though to assert his mastery of it. Every movement is deliberate. His speech is slow and his voice strong and low. When he laughs, he does so heartily. The walls resound in comradeship. But he laughs rarely. More often, he smiles, though his smile is not readily swift. He carries a battle harness, just within his easy capacity. And when arrayed for action, he clothes his body, just sufficiently for its protection. Every war-readied warrior must struggle to gain absolute mastery in the use of his chosen weapons by self-driven application. Though of greater importance to victory is complete control over himself in battle stance. His body stands poised, under the alert, controlling mind. Ready for any happening. He is never caught off balance in an awkward stance. Yet though this, the clashing fray, climaxes his life. It is only a thin, compressed slice of his allotted lifespan. For the battle is not lost in its own time and action. It is decided in the preparation which went beforehand. Many ask, for what does the warrior fight? It is not for fickle wealth and encumbering possessions. For these the grim warrior rarely gains. And what puny things they are against his glorious life. It is not for elusive freedom. For of all men, apart from slaves, he is the least free. It is not for his gods. For they, if they be god-powerful, require no champion. And if they do, are unworthy to be gods. It is not for mocking justice. For the disciplined warrior obeys, unquestionably. Even when the command is unjust. It is not for any fair city or cherished family. For so often, these betray him. This was the answer given when I, in my questioning youth, asked the same question of the battle master. And I still have none better. A man fights. Because it is the inbred nature of men to fight. And this is true. For it is only through strife that he becomes a man. A man lacking the human fighting spirit would be as unnatural a creature as a woman shunning motherhood. This goes against human inclination. 
yet true men do not despise these. For the nature of men and women is wide and varied, and there is a place in life for all. A warrior is a man responding gleefully to the stern demands of manhood, even as a mother is a woman lovingly responding to the demands of motherhood. The two are akin. For what motherhood is to a woman, war is to a man. Without motherhood, men would lose respect for womanhood. And without war, women would lose respect for manliness. All battles are not blood battles. There are other battles just as hard and demanding. And the blooded warrior who ignores them in unpreparedness is top-heavy and unbalanced. There is a just as deadly, if less obvious, war than any between kings and nations. And that is, the war of life. Here the warrior faces his most deadly adversary, which is himself. Man arms his own foe in the battle of life. And sends recruits to its ranks. The first rule of the warrior is obedience. And every warrior is a subordinate. The young cadet warrior, unblooded by battle, is the subordinate of every blooded man. Keenly young, abounding with high spirits, overflowing with energy. He is animal life, ever straining at the leash, baying to go, unwitting of caution. He will seek his outlets among companions of his own age. For in the presence of older men, he must exercise the disciplinary restraint of respect. It is never unmanly to show respect for age and wisdom. In fact, it indicates the triumph of discipline. Disrespect, for those to whom it is due, signifies character weakness, which is an unmanly defect. Young, full-blooded warriors are not willful women or wayward children. They are men who know their exact standing. Therefore, cadet warriors will always defer to the greater skill and wisdom of their superiors and show proper respect for men of high rank. The disciplinary warrior code need not be detailed, for it is written in the hearts of all true warriors and is a piece of essential equipment. A warrior is the protector of all women, even of the womenfolk of his foe. And he will not rape or abuse any woman or child. To strike a woman in the heat of battle, or to attack a child, is unmanly. And those who do so are a reproach to better men. He who strikes the weak and afflicted, the unarmed or unprotected, shall not be numbered among those in the ranks of true men. A man's estate is decreed according to his manliness, and honorable warriors are men of high estate. If they serve for gold alone and not with high intent, if they serve mercenary men of low estate who manipulate them, then they, too, are warriors of low estate. Peace will come to the world only when warriors unite to impose it. That is the bad dream of rulers, and men of cunning in high places. There is no debt to life placed on a man if he kill in a just war, or for his homeland, or for essential food, or in defense of the sanctity of his family. Nor if he slay the adulterer who defiles his household even though he become a martyr to marriage because of the laws of the land. It is unlawful to murder, which means killing for gain, or deceitfully, or striking behind the back. For true men, included in murder, is that which causes sorrow and suffering, which drive to death or robs the needy so they die, or takes away from a man his livelihood willfully, or unjustly, so his family perish. 
These are the things that were taught to Galahin of the bitter biting sword. No matter how grievous the crime of your comrade, he remains a comrade. And even though you condemn him at law, nevertheless, let the comradeship that was help to mitigate his lot. No matter how undeserving he may be. If all that happened was that your comrade could not withstand some temptation, do not disgrace or desert him. Say instead, it is possible that had the same circumstances befallen me, I might have been in the same boat with him. A knight is a man who serves the cause of duty, loyalty and good, and upholds the virtues of ladyhood. He is a man among men, resolute but quiet. He speaks little, but what he says carries more weight in the scales than an outpouring of words by others. Therefore, I say to you, be a knight at heart, and let your armor be what it will, for you are a better man than one bearing impregnable harness. A knight does not allow himself to become prey to melancholy and self-doubt. If you are convinced that you are a worthy knight of the Supreme Commander, you have true cause for rejoicing. A knight is one who acts when action is called for. And he remembers that proper deeds without and proper thoughts within. Strengthen him in times of testing. Loudmouthed men are to be despised, as are those who deal with ladies as they do with the common woman. The true knight deals with them rightly. A knight is never rowdy or boastful when he has been drinking mead or ale, nor does he ever become unsteady or lack self-control. He is never quarrelsome when in his cups, for this displays a small heart because you serve loyally and uprightly. Do not think that you will escape temptation and trial. You can call yourself a true knight only when you have overcome many temptations and trials. As the waters to fish and the air to birds, so is fear to the coward and sadness to the melancholy. Avoid the companionship of those who would contaminate you. And avoid hypocrites as you would the plague. They will fawn upon you. But this is the homage weakness pays to strength. Do not seek their praise. Nor expect life to be bountiful because of your goodness. Water loves the swimmer no more than the non-swimmer. Put no trust in yourself until after the days of testing. Never judge your comrade until you have stood in his place. Never take heed of the tangled-tongued ones, for they who talk in tangles will surely lure you into a delusive net. Give careful ear to the words of the wise and to the tales of the word masters. And always be a transmitter, not a transmuter, of traditions. A knight is steadfast. Never the prey of passion, swept along like mindless beasts, by every vagrant wind of impulse. He is the champion of true love. And knows that human love longing serves to initiate the soul spirit. Into the higher love that ultimately unites man with God. He honors the ideals of true love and shuns the lures of low love which pander to the baser passions. The man of knightly ideals aspires only to the love of a true lady. He avoids the available woman who has been the plaything of promiscuous men and is consequently the end product of careless, clumsy, self-satisfying use. The man who gives his heart to such as these is to be pitied by all true men. For he wallows in complacent but shallow satisfaction. Learn to be careful of every move. 
and consider it, just as the swordsman, has to consider every stroke. He never rains blows haphazardly, but remains alert to drive home the deadly thrust. There are sword thrusters and sword smiters, and each must master his own technique, for a proficiency means life. He who remains cool-headed and calm amid the cut and thrust of battle is a master of men. The young knight goes into battle saying, May I die like a true knight. But the battle chief says, Such a wish is wrong. For your desire should be rather to live like a true knight. And it will follow naturally that you will die like one. It is a lesser knight who desires to die for a cause. For the better men resolve that the foeman shall die for his cause. A knight must learn the wisdom of the wise and strike it on the tablets of his heart rather than having it as a babble on the tongue. He must know the difference between the indolent man and the cautious one. The difference lies in their use of the period between the action becoming necessary and doing it. One uses the interval for planning the action required and weighing its merits and demerits. The other, through shiftlessness, delays action until he is forced into it, and he is then found unprepared. A sober man was leaving a market town to journey home a few miles away and he met a drunken rake. And for safety, they journeyed together. As they passed by a wooded place, they were waylaid, attacked, and robbed. In the town there was a peddler, who next market day met the drunkard, and asked him whether it was safe to travel the road which the drunkard and the sober man had traveled previously. The rake assured him that there was no danger. When the peddler questioned his cuts and bruises, all the drunkard could say was that he must have gotten them while he was drunk and incapable. When the peddler put the same question to the sober man, he was warned about the footpads and advised to travel in the company of armed men. Thus it is with those who journey along the road of life. We meet two classes of advisors from which we can obtain advice. One, like the rake, tells that life is full of pleasures and there are no dangers along the road. The other cautions us against the dangers and pitfalls and urges us to travel well armed with prudence, discrimination, and the virtues. Have a warm and compassionate heart. As frozen water cannot cleanse the body, neither can a frozen heart wash impure stains from the soul. The knightly man treasures nothing so much as his honor which marks him as a man of high estate. Honor may be an attribute of the poor man, for it is not dependent on riches or station. Earth is an apple orchard with fruits delightful to the eye, which waft fragrance to the nose from afar. But at the core, its fruits have the maggots of bitterness and decay. Yet the orchard is good and senses its purpose, which is to produce fruit. It is not in the hashish fields of the hermit's contemplatory life that men develop their souls. This is an escape for the weak and timid from the stresses of life. Those who are simple seekers after the smooth path become drowned in a sea of unproductive felicity. You can pray. God help me when you have expended the last ounce of your strength. For he did not place men on earth to play, but to work. Duty, obligation, and responsibility are the man-makers. And these are slighted in the times and places where men are less than men. Always reach out beyond the frontiers of your limitations. For if you believe a thing to be impossible, then you yourself have made it so. 
conscience is the eye of God in man. And the prudent man lets nothing be seen which is unworthy, unwholesome, or unmanly. He is always circumspect in speech. For only those who can unring a bell are able to recall words spoken in haste. If earth were devoid of evil, how could we know what was good and judge the weak from the strong? How would we know what to strive against to progress? I am a man who has written many worthy things, and I have faithfully copied that which has been given me. Yet sadly, my efforts have brought me down. My clarity of vision has undone me. I have lived in a generation which scorns truth and cannot bear the stress of the search. It derides the simple things and seeks only after vain pleasures. All men fear a mind which sees more clearly than their own, and they destroy it in self-protection. All base men fear the tongue of truth, for it strips them and exposes their nakedness to mockery and scorn. To think is to be misunderstood by those who do not think. To voice new thoughts is to invite persecution. To have visions of greater things is to be hated by the visionless. And to be a maker of new things is to invite the scorn of the mindless. The Book of Origins, Chapter 10 The May Men Lore These are words of wisdom happily told of the teachings of the schoolmen who came from over the narrow sea. They journeyed from Durain and were children of Dardanos who was the first man to place a horse in harness. Costain was his son who married Linjilwin of the High Brow. The teachings disclosed strange things, but they were the lore of the land and served well when interpreted by the wise. Before times, they were unwritten. For that which was entrusted to perishable wood lost its power. And understanding came with the flow of words from the mouth. Every thought leaves an impress upon the spirit of the shadow self for good or evil. With every impress of evil, there is further corruption and distortion of the spirit form. With every impress of good, there is a strengthening force which beautifies the spirit form, and so it resides within in joy and content. There are seven spirit cankerers, which are meanness, theft, hypocrisy, fornication, cowardice, lust and envy. Earth, enveloped in ocean, and mantled in air, is the school wherein man, conceived in the likeness of the divine, plays his part as a pupil. The natural world is that which continues and develops from the creative impulse. The supernatural is that part of the natural not yet comprehended by men. The great God above all is a being composed of the collective souls of men departed to godhood. For it is written in times of yore that God died in the effort of creation. But a new God is being reformed. The whole of creation and life as it manifests is the effect of the old God being transmuted into a new one. It is also written in the books containing the words of the May Men that nothing can create itself or spring from nothing. All things must have something pre-existing to themselves which brought them forth. This is the law which teaches that there is a God, and only this God was unpreceded by anything. That which is preceded by nothing is God. The May Men argued the existence of God by calling upon the natural state of things as witness. 
there are seven absolute values, which are love, truth, beauty, wisdom, goodness, creativity, and justice. An animal, not having a soul form, lives only for the day. And if it lived a thousand years, would not be aware of anything out of place. But man, did he live for that time, would be intolerably bored. Nothing would give him pleasure. And he would dread the future and hate the present. If man were a mere mortal, struggling for self-existence, how can we account for his sense of moral obligation, his power of pity, his generosity, his ideals and aspirations? What other creature manifests these? Can these be qualities engendered through earthly life? Are the highest aspects of loyalty, the most devoted love, the noble self-sacrifices no more than the waste products of evolution? The soul is supreme above all. It should be master of its own forces and never permit itself to be led by its servants, the senses. The purpose of the moral restrictions and discipline imposed by religion is to give it mastery. Even as bodily discipline and proper care result in a healthful physical existence. The soul is awakened by love, by happiness and sorrow. The soul acts upon the body, but the body does not act upon the soul. For mind commands matter. The soul, awakening to conscious realization, becomes one with the law and is no longer the slave of external conditions, but the heir to truth. It is capable of rising above the illusions and uncertainties inherent in matter. The last part is rewritten and reconstructed, but the original sense is conveyed. There were originally over 18,000 words in this book. This concludes the Book of Origins, read by 31 Pearls. Please remember to subscribe and like.